Put down the remote, set your phasers to stun, and pick up that paperback. You do have books in the 24th century. Welcome to Episode 5 of Reading Trek, a Star Trek Book Club podcast, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Network. My name is William Conlin, and I'm joined by my co-host, Marty Ali. Marty, how are you doing today? Uh, aside from being a little bit tired, I'm doing really well. How about you? I am doing fantastic. So for those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a Star Trek book club podcast working through the expanded universe one novel at a time. Although we do encourage you to follow along with the reading, this podcast was designed as a way to give all fans a way to journey through the expanded universe together, even if you haven't read the books. If you're reading along with us, revisiting an old favorite, or if you just want to know more about the expanded universe, this is a podcast for all Star Trek fans. We've broken the show up into three main segments. The first is Turn the Page, where we summarize the reading and give our first reactions. Next is Highlight the Text, where we dig a little deeper and talk about the characters, plot, writing, and how it all connects to the larger Trek universe. And the last section depends on whether we've broken the book up, we'll either have Read Ahead, where we give our theories on the rest of the story, or we'll have Shelve It, where we wrap up the novel and give our final thoughts and ratings. Before we get started with our novel for today, we do have a little bit of an announcement. Um, Reading Trek is holding a contest, and you can enter to win a brand new hardbound copy of the autobiography of John Luke Picard by David A. Goodman. To enter, all you have to do is call our voicemail at 609-512-5527 and leave us up to a two-minute message with your thoughts on the show or something we've been reading. Well, that's fantastic, because we're going to be covering that book in several upcoming episodes. So if you win the book, then you can also call in and you can give us your thoughts on it after you read it. So that's really exciting. And hey, that's an easy contest to be involved in. It's not like we're making you do Domjot or something. (laughs) No Domjot contest here. Um, The winner of that contest will be announced after we finish the Star Trek Invasion series, which is coming up after the autobiography of James T. Kirk. And, of course, that schedule can be found on readingtrek.tricordertransmissions.com. Well, that's fantastic. It gives a lot of opportunity for people to call in because we really want to hear what you have to say. So not only are you getting to be a part of the podcast, but you've also got a chance to win a fantastic book that we're going to be covering soon. So let's give you that number one more time. Call 609-512-5527. That's 609-512-LLAP. With that said, let's get to today's selection. That's the book. I know it's a book. The book. Today we will be discussing chapters 1 through 17 of Star Trek Prometheus, Fire with Fire, by Bernard Perplis and Christian Humberg. All right, Marty, so when and where in the Trek universe does this book take place? The question isn't where we are. It's when we are. Fire with Fire takes place post-Nemesis in the year 2385. It is set just after the events of the novel series The Fall. Is there any trivia for us about this book? Why, yes, there is. So this series was originally published from July through September of 2016 in German and then later translated into English. The first series created exclusively for Germans. Nice. Fantastic. I wasn't aware you indulged in the literature of fantasy. Light reading is considered relaxing, Captain. Well, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Marty, for the recap. But first, we'd like to remind you that from here on out, there will be spoilers. Black alert. Black alert. Marty, would you be so kind as to turn the page for us? Last time on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Stardate 1966.9. The Constitution-class starship Valiant is out cataloging the Lombada Cluster when Captain Hayden notices that the 24 stars of the Cluster are glowing through a nebula in such a way that they look like demons. The science officer picks up some strange readings in one of the systems, and off they go to investigate. Beaming down to LC-132, the captain and his crew are investigating some ruins on the planet when the crew become increasingly agitated and start fighting with one another. They are on the verge of killing each other when they look up to see their Constitution-class starship enveloped in a swirling mist falling into the surface of the planet, causing a massive shockwave that engulfs them. Fast forward to 2385, Lieutenant Karen Adams 
is starting her beta shift on Starbase 91, just outside the Lombata cluster, when she notices discrepancy in the sensors. After some investigation, she realizes that a ship is on a collision course for the Starbase. The station goes to red alert just as the ship crashes into the Starbase, setting off a nuclear explosion, destroying the Starbase. Meanwhile, Captain Richard Adams and the crew of the USS Prometheus are on Deep Space Nine to watch the inauguration of the new Federation president when Adam gets a Priority One call. His niece has died on a terrorist attack on Starbase 91. The group is calling themselves the Purifying Flame. They are now a species that don't agree with the idea of exploring space, and they say that these space-dwelling societies are disrupting the harmony of their home spheres. The whole thing doesn't make any sense, since the Renau don't have technology needed for this kind of attack. It is possible that the Renau have joined the Typhon Pact, but they have to be sure. Shore leave is cancelled for the crew, and they are dispatched to the Lombata Cluster to pick up a special envoy and to investigate the attack. Adams is also ordered to take the new lieutenant, Jasit Aknamur. He's Renau and might provide some useful intel. Over on Quonos... Ambassador Alexander Roshenko hurries into the council chamber to meet with Chancellor Martok and the rest of the council. The council wants revenge for the recent attack on their dilithium mine stationed on a moon of Tika 4. The Klingons want to take the fight to the Renau, who have clearly claimed responsibility for the attack. Roshenko reminds the Chancellor that the Lombata Cluster, where the Renau live, are in Federation space. He convinces the Council to send one ship, the IKS Bortus, under the command of the drunk and disorderly Krom. It's the ship closest to that region. Rzhenko will hitch a ride on the Aventine and join the Bortus as it rendezvous with Prometheus for a joint investigation. On Lombata Prime, Captain Adams meets up with his envoy, Ambassador Spock, and delegates from Renau who deny government responsibility for the acts of terror although they do admit that they believe the Federation and the Klingons are disrupting the harmony of their home spheres, they would never turn to such acts of violence. In the debris field of the former Starbase 91, Lieutenant Commander Jenna Kirk, yes, that Kirk, and Lieutenant Commander Lanisa Zathin are hauling in strange pieces of debris and determine that some of the fragments belong to the short-range Romulan fighters. Spock believes that the evidence is still too inconclusive. It's unlikely that the Renau would have joined the Typhon Pact, given their disliking of outsiders. He suggests further investigation when the Prometheus receives a hail. The Klingons have arrived. Nicely done, Marty. There's some big names in this in this reading today, so I apologize if I have mispronounce anything well i tell you you've got to deal with andorians and klingons and yeah characters we haven't even seen before races we haven't seen before this is this novel sure packs a lot in there it does um so what was your first reactions to the first half of this novel well my first reaction was if they were to ever try and film this we would need every single person attending sdlv because this is a cast i mean this is an ensemble we have so many cameos in here we've got esri dax we've got admiral necheyev we've got alexander roshenko we've got i mean we've got like the whole breadth of Star Trek here, I think there is a reference in the first 17 chapters to every single previous Trek series. I, I, I'm looking through my notes. There's there's one for every single one of them. Just about, yeah. A hundred for Deep Space Nine. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. My first first reaction, of course, was on the first page. I liked the little touch of Stardate 1966.9. That's September 1966, the uh-huh. premiere date of T- TOS. Yeah. Hey, we got... James T. Kirk, right off the bat, having a little subspace chat with uh, the captain. Uh, I loved the visual, you know, that mental visual of the Constitution, you know, crashing into the planet. It reminded me of uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. Yeah, I had that in my mind as well. That prologue packed a punch. It really did. And that's why, I, you know, I started off really excited on the book. I got a, I, I went a little cold in parts because there was so much exposition, but I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I mean, going up to the halfway point, it started picking up more. And, and I think once everything got explained and we introduced a lot more characters, 
characters, it, it didn't feel as exposition-y later on. Yeah, my first reaction was it was exposition heavy. But then, like, I kind of see why they need to do that. It's the start of a new series, but it also has elements of of a, a couple different novel series in it, actually. So, um, But I didn't find that I had any problems getting into the books, even though I had not read anything before it yet. How about you? Yeah, same here. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about a Borg invasion. Uh, my interest has peaked. I think we're going to have to cover that on some future episodes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I just, I loved that there were so many references to, like, the really great episodes of DS9 and Voyager. Now, of course, Prometheus is a huge Voyager reference because we have um, season four, episode 14, which is message in a bottle where the, the, M the EMH, the doctor um, gets beamed back to the alpha quadrant through an alien relay network. And he and Andy Dick defeat the Romulans. Can I sum up a Star Trek episode better than that? No, that was great. I like that. Uh, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's references to DS nine with the adversary. We talk about the Zen Keithy um, who are an, yet to be seen alien race but they were you know in that episode of ds9 they uh, kind of weighed heavily on the federation when they were really worried that they were going to go to an all-out war with them i think this and kathy also pop up in star trek online if i'm remembering correctly do they you, you're the expert on that the star trek online i believe actually created the entire look for this and kathy um, with cbs as a blessing even though they were mentioned they never appeared on screen until star trek online Oh well, that's really cool, Marty. Can you throw up a picture of that on our Twitter account so that people can see what the what you're talking about there? Yes, I will find one and I will post it to Twitter. I'm really curious to see that. Uh, I love that we have uh, the first officer of Prometheus is a um, a Katean from from the animated series. Direct reference to Emress. Yeah, I actually just binge watched the animated series um, in the middle of reading this novel, and I saw the communications officer and i was just like oh my gosh i think that's the same race as as the first officer yeah and i prometheus i saw somebody cosplay that race in uh in vegas i think two years ago wow that is that is a feat to pull off it's really cool yeah really cool um so we have chell everyone remembers chell from voyager he's a lieutenant now it's nice to see he's still in it moving up we have mendon from one of my favorite um tng episodes um a matter of honor he's the um the blue kind of almost fish-like alien who has to have the respirator on he's the the science officer who kind of goes above his station and keeps bothering Worf during that great TNG episode. Yeah, I and mean, wasn't he also the one that um, won that, like, Academy contest with Wesley Crusher? Did he now? Let me... Let's memory alpha that. Yeah, I remember an episode with... I think it's the first time we saw the Benzite, actually. Interesting. So according to... Yeah, the episode is Coming of Age... That is season one, episode 19. And according to Memory Alpha, it's actually a different character, but the same actor. And they just brought him back as a uh, as a different character for a matter of honor. Huh. But the same race? Same race. Yes. Sounds like it. Yeah. It's so weird. Interesting. Uh, let's see. What else do we have in here? We've got some breaking news. Andor has left the Federation. Uh, that was shocking, but completely believable, considering the way Andorians have acted in Star Trek. Yep. Um, and I think that's explained further, again, in one of the other novels that we haven't read yet. Yeah, Population Crisis, I think they were saying. I'm curious to learn about that. We have a new foil, the Purifying Flame. Yes. Um, and basically, their entire motives are they think that the Federation and all the other alien species that are running around are disrupting the harmony of their home spheres. And there's a great little line on 68 that sums it up pretty well. Quote, you are the reason, just you, you and your blind arrogance, you and your reckless stupidity, you and your barbarism. The galaxy has turned into a place of fear and terror. And that is your fault alone. War and invasions, wherever you look, misery and suffering, distrust and resentment. Recent years have inflicted more scars on this universe than entire millennia before. Hmm. Uh, my question for you is, how do you feel about the purifying flame and their motives? 
Yeah, well, I think they're they've already been set up as a fantastic Trek villain because you've got you know these dastardly attacks on both Starfleet and the Klingon Empire. So uh, it certainly sets them up to be you know real bad guys. I'm I'm very curious to see where it goes in that second half, and and the fact that they're also um, framing another species for it, you know, trying to incite a war almost seemingly. Right. Uh, it just, uh, I, I think they're a fascinating uh, villain and remains to be seen whether they truly are the villains or not. It could be a, another twist and turn. It's also fascinating that they're using Romulan technology to carry out all these attacks, considering their whole thing is they don't want to associate with any other um, alien species, um, you know. Uh, but the Renau, as a species, are very xenophobic, mm-hmm. and it the the motives here do kind of bear a little bit of similarity to our own political times, you know, regarding we're recording this in uh, 2018 and there's talk of, you know, trying to deport foreigners who um who came here illegally um even though, you know, we're a country of immigrants, but yeah, and, and I think it's also interesting for uh the Renau and their concepts of you know, not being adventurous, of being very sedentary, that they don't want to explore the stars, and that's what actually turned them off of the Federation, because despite being um, a faster-than-light species, they cut off their ties and they go very introverted because they don't want to They don't want to explore the stars. And I think Josset has a great line. Uh, I, I'm on Kindle, so I don't have page numbers, but at location 1,827, he says, um, in talking about attending Starfleet Academy, he says, for four years he had fought a battle to accept San Francisco on the planet Earth as his new sphere. It hadn't been easy because part of a cadet's life was traveling to different worlds and training flights aboard other vessels. His comrades had provided Jassat with the stability that he so desperately required. During his four-year tenure, there had been little to no fluctuation, which was gratifying. So I think that's that's a fascinating uh, look into a species that doesn't have that intrepid nature that so many people in the Federation have. What are your thoughts on that, Marty? Yeah, I think... I think he's he's a great character. He's not my favorite character in this first half, but he's definitely an intriguing character. Um, and I think, I hope we get a lot more out of that in the future of this series. Yeah, so um, speaking of other characters on uh, the Prometheus, I think um, there is a, uh, a giant William Shatner-shaped uh, balloon in the room to talk about. We have a Kirk on the Prometheus. We do. Um, a descendant of Kirk's brother. Yes. Not Kirk himself, but a Kirk nonetheless. Um, it is interesting that the writers would in- choose to include that family lineage into this character when she could have just been someone completely new. Um Unless there is something down the line with her lineage relating to an aspect of the story, I don't um, see why she would have needed to be a Kirk. Yeah, that was my first thought as well, because you have that cameo of Kirk in the beginning, and and this is being directly tied to Kirk's era. I, I feel like that's obviously a reason why she's there, and, and you know, there's... That, that it'll come around to that. Yeah, especially with the Valiant crashing on the planet. Yes. My favorite character in the first half was um, the Andorian, the Andorian security chief, Lenisa Hassin. I love that we're slowly getting to know this crew as a whole, but she, for me, was the most interesting so far. Mm-hmm. Um, she had just kind of a really nice moment on page 128 so she's having a affair with the beta z doctor aboard the ship and i'll just read the quote here gentle like water that patiently wears down rock his eyes bored into her mind she knew that he was seeing through her you can't fool a beta zoid and this is after he gets up to leave because she um, 
she senses that he is developing feelings for her and she is not into that. So I'm wondering um, if that kind of wall she's put up is going to play a greater role in the story. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I think Andorians are some of the most fascinating characters in all of Trek and they are so underutilized. There's so, there's so much more to tell with them. I've, I've said many times that one of my favorite characters in all of Trek lexicon is Shran played by Jeffrey Coombs in enterprise. Mm -hmm. Cause I think you see an, an incredible arc in the way that he is. And, and I kind of saw the same thing in her uh, and I saw, yeah, very, very close to that, quote that you just gave i think shortly thereafter they talk about this is i think this is the first time i've ever seen in star trek somebody talk about friends with benefits and yeah i thought that was a very modern thing to include in there very interesting and and there's also the scene in in classic trek i mean i think it's very rare to see two aliens you know, um, intimate. It's usually a human and another alien, which kind of ties right. Trek back to us. The primary example, obviously, is Jadzia and Worf. Uh, but um, there's this great scene where uh, they quote, um, half an hour later, they were laying side by side on Lenisa's bed. The thin shimmering blanket covered their naked bodies halfway. Lenisa's head rested on Garen's shoulder, and he had put his arm around her. Her antennae swayed slightly while she was drawing imaginary circles on his chest. I, I just thought that was an incredible visual. Yeah, it was great. It was, again, one of the reasons I'm gravitated toward this character is because of that that scene in the book right there. Mm -hmm. I think it was a, a very well written in. Um, we got a cute moment with Cork on DS9. I love that they included Cork. <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely. Hey, he um, just never was, seems to get a break, does he? He never really does. Um, page 49. You call this quality workmanship? Cork ranted. All right, we'll try it the old-fashioned way, yelling at it. Cork rushed around the bar and made his way between the busy tables, ignoring all the quizzical and mocking looks of his guest. His hollow screen wasn't working when everybody is trying to watch the president's inauguration at his bar because he did not pay his bill. <laughs> that's great, and that's and that's the Orion Syndicate, so uh Yep. <laughs> so many classic Trek tropes. That's great. It's great to have all these references in here, but I also started to get wary after a while because it felt like we were kind of starting to get into the fan service realm but i still enjoyed it it's that's that hard balance of you know when do you reach too much a and i think what helps with that is that they go they go really deep in because you have to be a serious trek fan to get some of the deep references you've got um the uh fleet admiral who's in charge of starfleet uh is leonard james akar who is the baby born in the episode friday's child from tos and they're saying, you know, he here he is now. His species lives longer than humans, so he's 120 years old. Uh, so that's that's the baby from an original series episode. And I thought that was an interesting deep dive moment as well. Yeah. I don't know if they were so... Like, a lot of these were definitely fan service -y, like Chief O'Brien and Rom moments, like when they're touring the Prometheus, that seemed fan service-y. Mm-hmm. Um, because they didn't really service the story at all. Um, and then I'm curious what they're planning to do with Ambassador Spock. Yeah, that shocked me when that came in there. So there's there's definitely a whole new realm of possibilities when you introduce Spock into the story. Right. So I have no idea what they're planning to do with Spock. Hopefully we get a little more with Spock in the later half of the novel. Mm-hmm. Because um, I think that would be that would be fantastic. Now, before we get too far away from that, the the thing that I thought was interesting as far as like avoiding fan service is the way that you can sprinkle something in without making it too overt. Like I agree one hundred percent. The Chief O'Brien and Rom moment was just there was no real purpose for it. It was that was fan service. Whereas I thought um, in the scene in Quarks, it was fun to just mention. There's one line in there that says. A lonely Lurian at the counter stared into his tankard in disappointment. And everybody who's reading that is going to go, mourn. Mourn. That was nice. That was a nice touch. Because that was subtle. It wasn't so in your face like Cheap O'Brien. Yeah, exactly. 
Well, let's talk. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Deep Space Nine because uh, the Deep Space Nine that we all know and love is no more. Yes, I don't think that is new news. It's new to us okay. who haven't read any of the other novels, but I, I have known through like the mycelial Star Trek rumor network that Deep Space Nine has been destroyed for for quite a few years actually ah, okay. in the novel verse so but yeah that's kind of interesting that they rebuilt it and it looks exactly the same as the old deep space nine i hope they didn't use um cardassian technology this time but you never know that that would be great if they put in all of those old um security tricks from gul dukat why why would you do that why wouldn't you what's the name of that episode where they uh, where they're all uh, under the booby traps i love that episode I don't remember. I don't know episode titles. <laughs> I'm like um like friends episode titles. The one with the one with Gold Ducat and the booby traps, you know. Or Civil Defense, I believe is the episode if I'm reading this correctly. Yeah, it's a, that's a that's a great episode where everyone just keeps getting locked under another booby trap and even Ducat gets stuck with one then. Ducat, you have abandoned your post. Yeah, Deep Space Nine's great. It's always great to be on Deep Space Nine. Um, I think another, my my other favorite parts of the novel were the bits with, um, with Krom down on the planet when he's just drunk and fighting with people. Yes. Uh, I love that scene. Um, and I love that in, in the council chamber, when they're talking about which ship is closest, everyone just kind of rolls their eyes when they realize who it is. Um, so I, I smell a little bit of trouble with this guy in the future. Yeah, I thought the first thought that went through my head is, ah, we're going to have a redemption story here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think because the Klingons are so gung-ho for war, you know, they just want to, like, fight, fight, fight. So I think it's going to be that kind of battle between maintaining the values of the federation and you know doing what needs to be done to get um the situation resolved which is something that we've had a lot of experience in recently with star trek discovery and the discovery novels and mm -hmm. um so it's interesting that they kind of keep going back to this this theme of do you betray your your values to to get the job done? Yeah, something else that I, I think is long time coming in Trek, but I'm kind of new to it is this whole quantum slipstream technology. So, what do you know about that, Marty? Um, I know that the USS Aventine, under the command of Esri Dax was the first Starfleet ship to have it. So I am looking forward to uncovering that in future novels. Um, and I don't know anything about how the drive works itself, but from what I could take from this book is that um, the Prometheus was able to go from one side of Federation space to the other in a day and a half versus at you know their top warp, warp 9.9, .9, it would have been taken them two and a half weeks. Yeah, because I love the line that um, I think Spock says, where he says it, it appears that the era of warp drive is ending. So there seems to be a theme in Star Trek novels that I am discovering that the perspectives of characters, you're jumping around from one character to another. Um, however, I thought that the perspectives were jumping around way too much in this novel mm -hmm. and it didn't seem completely necessary for the story um but because it's been a narrative staple of star trek i feel like a lot of these authors feel like they have to kind of jump around in the perspectives a little bit do you have any thoughts about 
about that. Well, I agree in the sense that we didn't need as much exposition on characters, especially characters that were about to die. Um, because I think as Trek fans, we can all feel enough compassion to know that it's a bad event when a star base is destroyed and 4,000 people are killed. I don't think we really needed like, you know, a whole chapter of one person on the star base or one person on a Klingon mining camp. If, um, if we see a character who's a captain, and he says, my niece was on that star base, you're going to feel for them right away. You didn't really need a whole chapter about that niece. And, you know, to have two chapters where it just ends with, and then the character died, I, I felt like that was a bit much to have in a book. It was reasonable to have that at the beginning with the TOS era uh, constitution ship crashing and you know they says that's the last thing the captain ever felt uh i think that was good that was a really great setup you know because it it pulls you into the story but then to have that happen two more times it seemed like a bit much yeah it did seem like i kind of get what they were going for like trying to make us feel like the excitement and the panic in the moment and like there's nothing they could do to stop it it just it was sudden and quick and nobody saw it coming so like in that respect i appreciated it but then again it's just like now we're never like i invested in trying to figure out who this character is and then they were gone you know so yeah um, exactly then re relating to that i would i would have liked to have just focused on the prometheus officers instead of distracting us with these kind of fan servicey characters like Spock and Alexander Roshenko Captain and Chester Martok and Ro Lauren, yeah and Esri Dax and you know I just want I want to get to know the Prometheus characters I want to get to know I want to get to know our crew that we're following in in this novel yeah, exactly. You know, jumping around to like the first officer of the Bortas, who's not really doing anything and, you know, stuff like that. It's just, it's, it's just a little unfocused in my opinion. I agree a hundred percent. And this is something that I've said in, in, I think our second episode and our third episode, and I'm going to probably say it 500 more times throughout the series we do this, but space is big people. Esri Dax has something to do far, far away from this. Why does she need to be there? Yeah, it could have been any ship. The only reason they put it in there was to name drop the Aventine and to have like a fan favorite character in there. And and I would, kind of harkening back on what I was saying just a few minutes ago, if you're going to do that, I would prefer that you give us like a deep dive, like like give us give us somebody who's like really obscure maybe that, that only a real real well-versed trek fan might get and then and then it makes it feel even better when somebody realizes it because it's you know to say esri dax or ro lauren every single person is going to get that but try throwing out like um decker or something you know or who is the captain um who took over for picard um in chain of command Jellico, yes, exactly. Have like Jellico come in, or have or have Captain Morgan Bateson from the Bozeman. That's uh, cause and effect. Have him deliver them. That's the kind of stuff that I think is really cool because it it accentuates your your deep love of Trek rather than just throwing out you know oh that's somebody that that we all know and that's cool but it's just another one. We don't need that cast of characters to be so big. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I hope, like, the later half of the book, it gets a little more focused and we can just kind of zero in on what's really important Yeah. in this novel. So, um, Marty, do you have any other standout moments? I don't think I do. We covered a lot of it. Um, lots of familiar names, all the alien species. I counted an Andorian, the Renau, the Cetacean... The Bullion, the Betazoids, the Benzites, the Vulcans. So many species on board the Prometheus. Um, Can you imagine the makeup budget on filming this? On an episode? Yeah, that would be crazy. Um, I love that we got a like 10 forward type lounge called the Starboard 8. Yeah, lounge. Starboard. 
starboard eight. Which is kind of cool. Um, and yeah, I think that is all I had. Well, I had just one more because I thought it was a very cool introduction for Prometheus for people who might not know the Voyager episode. I just thought the way that Prometheus was first seen, you know, in that um, gas giant um, kind of coming out of nowhere and and the uh, two aliens are going, um, there's three ships coming. And then they realize it's all one ship separated. I thought that was a very cool introduction of our, yeah, um, of our ship character. I think the Prometheus is going to be an interesting character yeah Ted, do you know um just weird side note has eagle moss put out the prometheus yet um i believe so i think i have one. Oh, that's awesome cool we're gonna have to check that out that's probably get some detailed shots of that and put that up on our twitter page yeah excellent um but then oh another little bit of trivia that i forgot to include um, the art on the cover of this book, they actually created a, a special 3D rendering of the Prometheus just for this trilogy of novels. Nice. So the image on the front cover is a newly created, C- like, complete CGI model of the ship. Well, that's fantastic. That's the kind of detail that I that I love about the Star Trek universe because it's it's worth it. You know, it's worth it for the fans, and they yeah, appreciate it. Is. And um, the, speaking of the cover art, I assume that the space station that we're seeing in the back blowing up that is Starbase ninety one. I guess. I believe it is. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting. It's a great looking ship. I think. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to go through this uh, series because there's, uh, what, two other books? It's a trilogy? It's a trilogy, correct. Excellent. And we're going to be covering them on future episodes as well. Yeah. So for the reason we're covering this kind of out of canon order, quote unquote, is because it's a relatively new novel and we, we do want to prioritize the the new Trek novels that come out and then throw in some of the older stuff in between. Um, so that's why there's a lot of a lot of stuff we haven't covered yet, but... But hey, that's how we all uh, handle our Trek literature. There's just so much of it, it's impossible to try and do it in sequence. Um, and I did post a flowchart to um, our Twitter accounts the other day to kind of give give listeners a sense of what we're dealing with here. It's just kind of, it all crisscrosses and connects, and one book leads into some other series completely, so... There's going to be a little bit of a a learning curve as we're going through this. Yeah, because you look at the timeline now, we're in um, 2385. I'm not sure how far into the future does uh, Ambassador Spock, uh, you know, wind up going into the um, the time portal and waking and coming back in the 2009 Trek film. I was thinking about that as he was introduced. I'm like, shouldn't he be headed for certain doom by now? But I guess it's not that that far into the future, so... So I'm looking right here. Okay, yeah, so um, according to Memory Alpha, our good friends at Memory Alpha, um, the Vulcan Science Academy builds the jellyfish, and Ambassador Spock flies it into the black hole in the year 2387, so that is two years after the events of this book. Oh my gosh. Wouldn't it be cool? Now this speculation, I guess we're moving on to read ahead now. <laughs> um, so speculation, it'd be really cool if at the, I'm just going to jump all the way, the last book in the series, we we end up seeing the jellyfish. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. I'd love to see that kind of a tie-in. And I believe, I haven't read it yet, but I believe there is a comic book that ties into the lead-up of that. I think it's called Countdown. So, um yes. We can we can examine that in the future because and here's an exclusive for you reading Trek listeners out there. We are going to start adding in some supplemental episodes in the future and covering some of the non gold key comic books. Uh gold keys you can listen to our uh sister program Drawing Trek, which covers all those great classics, but we're gonna talk about some of the modern day comic books. Yes, we are, and I'm so excited. And I believe, I'm not speaking out of turn here, our good friend Shisank from the Polytrex podcast will be joining us for those. Yeah, we're excited to have him on here. It's going to have a lot of non-political discussion. That's his show. Yeah. All right. Um, Will, what do you think is going to happen in the 
in the future of this novel? Well, I think it's going to be an interesting journey into the Lambetta cluster. I think there's a lot of peril out there. Uh, I think we've got some malevolent force that took down a Constitution class ship a long time ago, and I'm curious as to what's going to happen when Prometheus encounters that. Um, I think the one character we didn't mention in all of our discussion, I think, is Captain Adams. I think he is a fantastic character. I'm really curious to see where he goes in the story. Um so I, I'm curious to see how he handles whatever evil is out there, as well as these still unknown villains. Um, how are the Klingons going to handle it? You've, if you've got something that can turn good people bad, what happens when you have a Starfleet battlecruiser and a Klingon uh, battlecruiser right next to each other in space? Yeah, I think it'll make for some good, some good drama for sure. Um, <clears throat> my prediction is that... This this purifying flame is going to have something to do with the Constitution class crashing into a planet. Um, and I'm even wondering if some of those characters we saw in the prologue are going to resurface in some way. Because um, I think that would be really fascinating as well if that's, if that's something that, that comes about at the end of the book. And you know what that makes me think of right away? Star Trek Beyond. You have the same oh, thing. Yeah. You have the uh -huh. same thing with the USS Franklin crashing into a planet a and people being trapped there for a century or longer. So that's that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's really cool. And of course, I'm going to uh, also just um throw this in there because it happens every single I think every single episode we've done so far, I've been able to make this reference. We have a transparent aluminum reference in this book, so I am going to take a shot of whiskey now. Chapter 8. Is it? Chapter 8? Oh my gosh, I missed it! Okay, let's see. Um, they were both wedged into the driver cabin. Behind them on the long truck bed lay several tools waiting for their daily use. Oh, it's the Klingon uh, on the Klingon um, mining planet. Oh! So yeah, on the Klingon mining planet, there is a reference to transparent aluminum. So in keeping tradition, I shall take a shot. Transparent aluminum? <laughs> You're going to be so drunk by the end of this podcast. <laughs> um, I love that they keep throwing little things in like that to just kind of carry over from book to book. Just to like, it's kind of like almost like a tradition for writers to try and uh, include things like that in their novels, which, which makes me really happy. It is the literary Wilhelm Scream. And if you don't know what the Wilhelm Scream is, Google it right now. You will not be disappointed. All right, well, I think that wraps up Read Ahead, so now let's move into our fan feedback. We didn't have any direct feedback about this book, but we can uh, review some of the comments that have been on our Twitter feed over the week. Uh, our good friend Heather Barker and our previous guest and, and our future guest gave us a great announcement, which we are very, very excited about because we are prepping to do the autobiographies of James T. Kirk and John Luke Picard. Well, it was announced this week that on October 16th, 2018, they will be releasing the autobiography of Mr. Spock. I am so excited. I already put it in our schedule, so we will for sure be covering that as soon as it comes out. Excellent. And since we've had um since we've had uh Tyler Habiger on our schedule for uh, both of the autobiographies. I think we should have both him and Heather on for that if they're uh, able to do That's it. That's a I great think, idea. I think that would just be so much fun. Agreed. Cool. Well, then we also have a, a discussion on here from Polytrex. They've been talking about the comics, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, Shashank is going to be joining us in the future. And then we had a great shout out from our friend Dayton Ward, who gave us an interview last week about his book, Drastic Measures. If you go to Dayton's blog, which is DaytonWard.wordpress.com, you can check out the article he wrote about our conversation with him. It's titled, what do you know? It's another Drastic Measures interview. Dayton Ward had such kind words to say to us, and I can't thank him enough for coming on the show. Yeah, I can't wait to have him back because we're going to do a lot more of his books. He's got, what did he say, he's at 30 Trek novels now, so we're going to definitely... Something like that, yeah. We're going to definitely go through that. 
And then uh, lastly, um, just a couple of days ago, if you go on our Twitter, you can take a look at a picture of Marty and me in Los Angeles with Dr. Flox himself, Mr. John Billingsley. We had a great time attending uh, Dan Devey's Gaze in Space equality event uh, in Hollywood. And as always, he has uh, at least one Trek actor come and... Um, John was just absolutely fantastic. He was there making people laugh and signing autographs and taking photos. A delightful man. It was a pleasure to um, share uh, Taco Bell with him. Yes. Quesadillas with flocks. <laughs> Cool. Well, that that's kind of a wrap up of uh, our weekly responses and posts on Twitter. So with that, um, Marty, why don't you tell us what we're going to be covering on our next episode? Next time on Reading Trek, we will be discussing chapters 18 through 37 of Star Trek Prometheus Fire with Fire. Wow, is that a book? As always, you can view our upcoming schedule online at readingtrack.thetricordertransmissions.com. Before we finish today's podcast, let's let everyone know how they can get a hold of us to continue the conversation. If you'd like to get a hold of the show with your comments, questions, and feedback, you can find us on Twitter at ReadingTrek and by email at ReadingTrekPodcast at gmail.com. If you would like to enter the voicemail contest or if you just want to leave us a message about our show, you can leave us a two-minute message with your thoughts for our next show. Please call 609-512-5527. That's 609-512-LLAP. Again, please try to keep your messages less than two minutes, but we really, really do want to hear what you have to say. Uh, don't forget, um, you can win a copy of the autobiography of Jean-Luc Picard. Oh, that would be so cool. I, I can't wait to get to the autobiography. That's going to be great, and we want to hear your feedback. So please support this vibrant fan-based podcast network by visiting patreon.com slash the tricorder transmissions. For as little as $1 a month, Patreons can get exclusive early access to some of our unedited shows, interviews, and even get to join in on exclusive Patreon-only chats. We have lots more Patreon content on the way, so you won't want to miss it. So visit patreon.com slash the tricorder transmissions. Be sure to mention that Reading Trek sent you. And with that... Captain Picard wants us to let him read in peace. I will leave you now to your book. That is all I ask. <laughs>